Australia, toward the middle of 2021, was in a really difficult position. That A, uh, eventually the virus would find a way in, and B, that Australia cannot be cut off from the world indefinitely. We want freedom! We want freedom! Such an unprecedented shift in how we live our lives was made in face of this pandemic. This story was about the really difficult transition that Australia needed to pull off in terms of figuring out how the country was going to move into the future in a world where COVID is just a part of life. So if you think back to February 2020, things changed incredibly fast. We had a confirmation of human-to-human -human transmission in Wuhan, and then very quickly it's first case, first case, first case in just country after country all over the world. In those critical weeks in Australia, there weren't a lot of domestic measures taken at that point. There was no sign of the panic that was then really just starting to take hold in parts of Europe and the United States. My name is Annika Stobart. I work at the Grattan Institute, which is Australia's leading policy think tank. I work in the health and aged care policy program. A key contributor to the cases in Australia's first wave was the Ruby Princess cruise ship. People had been sick and these people didn't actually end up in isolation, they ended up back into the community. It contributed to a lot of Australia's deaths in that first wave. Australia was grappling with the idea of how to manage the COVID pandemic long term when there weren't any vaccines available at the time. And this is when this unique idea of the COVID zero approach emerged. We are upgrading the travel ban on Australians to level four for the entire world. The travel advice to every Australian is do not travel abroad. They just closed the borders completely. No one in, and, and, and remarkably, uh, as the policy evolved, it became clear that the rule was no one out either. You needed to actually apply for permission from the Australian government in order to leave the country on the theory that anyone leaving would eventually need to come back in and would thus be a problem for the Australians to keep COVID out. There was a lot of debate about whether that was the right way to do it. Essentially, there were two courses that the state minister could take. One was to accept that there would be a lot of community transmission and therefore have to limbo in and out of lockdowns to control cases. And the alternative option was to actually lock down very strictly in a way that enabled us to get to a point where there were effectively zero cases. No tourists, no business travellers. The few people who were allowed to come in spent 14 days in hotel quarantine and it was enforced by the military. For anyone who breaches quarantine, they face fines and even jail. The penalties ranging from as much as $50,000 in WA and 12 months behind bars. 11,000 or six months jail in New South Wales, while Queensland, Victoria and South Australia all had the power to punish. These were uh, devastating public health measures for many people. Australia is a nation of immigrants. Something like 30% of the population was born abroad. So the inability to travel had huge costs, personally, economically, for many millions of people in Australia and outside of it. It was difficult for people. Most Australians have connections with communities overseas, family, friends. Many businesses that relied on international tourists really struggled. But when the country emerged from this first wave of lockdowns, life very rapidly took on something like its, its pre-COVID normalcy. Uh, you could go to bars and beaches and restaurants. Hamilton even went on stage in Sydney. People were going into offices. Because we are an island nation, we had the opportunity to actually have very few cases in the community until a vaccine would hopefully arrive in the future. 
nationally, the daily case numbers in some periods were in the single or, or at most the double digits. They could go months without a single COVID death when the US, for example, was recording literally hundreds of thousands of deaths. Australia might record a death every few months. When Australia locked down, they really did. They got the level down very, very low. We never really locked down as well or as completely as Australia did. So epidemiologically, in terms of protecting uh, lives, these policies were spectacularly successful in that period. Once Australia was able to return to normalcy so much faster than the rest of the world, you had overwhelming public support, and so much so that anyone who suggested uh, an alternative was, was almost shouted down. Virgin CEO has courted controversy while calling for Australia's international borders to reopen before mid-2022. At one point, the CEO of Virgin Australia said eventually the borders would have to open and that when they do, people may die political figures attacked her vociferously. Scott Morrison said he could have no truck with comments like that. And it was a real warning to other public figures in Australia that proposing to live with the virus was taboo. It was just something, it was something you couldn't say. It became the third rail of Australian politics for a time. Whereas a lot of other countries, uh, the UK, Canada, the US, moved to lock up vaccine supplies as soon as they could, Australia took a different approach and a somewhat uh, leisurely one in retrospect. There was this kind of sense that, from the government at least, that things had been sorted, that there was this sense of complacency and that kind of rolled over into how they thought about the vaccine rollout, which was a key failure of the government's response. Australia didn't make a deal with Pfizer until November 2020, well after other countries had done so. Instead, Australia's strategy was to focus on the AstraZeneca vaccine through local manufacturing. So when we started the vaccine rollout with the AstraZeneca, we had a couple of fatalities and the media highlighted those fatalities and inadvertently caused panic. I think the government, they should have prepared the public about those rare side effects and at the same time speeded up the Pfizer mRNA based vaccination. A major public education campaign was underway. Visit australia.gov.au. But it was mainly addressing the mainstream Anglo-Saxon background communities and society. And they left the non-English speaking community through that public education campaign. And the weakest point for the spread of that virus was in people who were not targeted by a public education campaign. I started in front of my house a COVID assessment and testing clinic and it was a drive through I used that also as an education area where I can send the right messages to our local community in the Canterbury-Bankstown area. There was much influence of pseudo-science on social media and a lot of propaganda and conspiracy theories. The public did not have the right information about COVID pandemic and the virus itself. And unfortunately, that gap needed to be addressed very soon. A few months ago, Australia was the envy of the world, winning the war against COVID, borders closed, but businesses open, life relatively normal. But as the highly infectious Delta variant takes hold and our vaccine rollout lags, we're becoming headline news for all the wrong reasons. Delta became the dominant strain and made its way to Australia through leakages in hotel quarantine and ended up causing a major outbreak. In March 2021, around 3% of Australians had been fully vaccinated, whereas the US and UK were, were well on their way to vaccinating the bulk of their populations. A more transmissible variant in an under-vaccinated population is kind of a nightmare scenario. So Australia had to panic, and that meant these very harsh lockdowns, and it also meant an effort to step up vaccination as quickly as they could. 
It started in Australia's most popular state, New South Wales, and then eventually spread to Victoria, Australia's second most populous state. Half the country was in lockdowns. Schools closed, offices closed, all of these freedoms that Australians had taken for granted for the better part of the last year uh, were once again taken away. All Australians need to accept a hard truth. COVID is here to stay. Delta was just too transmissible. The genie was out of the bottle. Australia was never going to be able to get back to COVID zero. But Australia needed to come to a new understanding of what living in the COVID age looked like. Today, uh, it was confirmed and fully agreed that the national plan, that pathway that takes us to the position where we live with this virus. And we live with the virus where we ultimately start saying goodbye uh, to lockdowns once we reach 70% vaccination of the population. This U-turn was politically controversial. There was a lot of criticism, particularly uh, Western Australia and Queensland. The premiers of those states were not really on board. Politics with a battle erupting over how the states manage the virus. Mark McGowan insists WA's freedoms need to be maintained. Uh, we don't need rash decision making on the basis of what is occurring in New South Wales. There is an Australia outside of New South Wales. Let's have a look at the number of cases in New South Wales and Queenslanders don't want to see those case numbers come into Queensland. So that is why there is a border closure. But there was, I think, a, a sense of resignation that this was the only way to go. This cycle of, of lockdowns and freedom, lockdowns and freedom had to stop and, and that the only way to stop it, it was to try a new approach. Easing restrictions, but only easing restrictions for people that were double vaccinated. People that were unvaccinated would essentially continue to uh, have the lockdown restrictions apply to them indefinitely. 18 months of isolation and frustration boils to breaking point. So-called freedom rally in Melbourne, seeing violence break out between protesters and police. Some people felt like this was imposing on them in a way that they didn't support. There were some protests against vaccine mandates, which got pretty ugly at times. Governments did not back down. Uh, there was uh, really very little compromise at any point. You must be double vaccinated in order to enter Australia, with essentially no exceptions. One example of that, kind of spectacular example of that, was Novak Djokovic, arguably the best tennis player in the world, who was kicked out of Australia because he had entered without being double vaccinated to play in the Australian Open. Djokovic had his visa revoked after being held at Melbourne Airport for several hours. There should be no special rules for Novak Djokovic at all. That is an example of just how serious the Australian government is going to take the vaccination issue. Once vaccination rates in Australia reached high levels, this triggered different levels of liberalization. We saw an end to lockdown measures, things like restaurants and nightclubs reopened. In November, the borders reopened in some respects. The first flight from Los Angeles today was QF12 under the new conditions. And there was a real party mood down here at Sydney Airport's arrivals terminal. Omicron has come in and has arrived with the same full force that it did elsewhere. But high vaccination rates have done the job of preventing large numbers of deaths. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, there, are, there are many strong arguments against the policy mix that Australia pursued. It saved an incredible number of lives. Economically, uh, it's a little less clear. If you look at 2020 GDP performance across major economies, Australia was more or less flat. And uh, part of that was simply being able to get back to normal. Resuming normal life for most people most of the time was a, uh, a bigger economic positive than closing the borders was an economic negative.